We are in Philippians. We did an introduction a couple weeks ago, but we never got back to it. So now we're going to get started here, if you will, in Philippians chapter 1. And I think you did hit go live, Richard. Thank you. All right. So let me begin by asking, uh, how do you pray for the church? When you pray for the church, what do you pray? Is it grudging, oh, Lord, bless? those people down there? Or is it, Lord, my Sunday school is great, but it's those other classes, you know, or Lord, help that preacher. Man, he needs all the help he can give. What is it? Or do you pray in joy? Lord, thank you for the church you put me in. That's what we're looking at here is Paul's prayer for this church at Philippi. So let's read his prayer. It's verse 3 to verse 11, all right? I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for for me to think this of you all, Because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. You all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and and all discernment. That you may approve the things that are excellent that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So, do you pray with joy? We looked there in the first three verses, Paul praying, says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, upon, or, uh, remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you, For you all with joy, for or because your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now why is he saying joy? Would it not first of all because of this partnership that there is between him and the church there at Philippi, that they're they're a partnership in the gospel? Paul and the church of Philippi has a history. Alright? He basically started it. He's the, the, the... the earthly father, if you will, but his relationship with them is not just in the past. It's not just history there. It is something ongoing in their lives and so forth, so it's not concluded. So he's recognizing that he's not alone in this world. He's not alone, though he's in prison. This church has not abandoned him. That this church is still meaningful to him. Sometimes when people get in a bad situation, they're going through difficult times, people, whether it's by, on purpose or just uh, time, or get so involved in other things, they forget. It's, it's, my son kind of got upset. When he went to the Marine Corps, kids wrote him at the beginning, school buddies and so forth. And they wrote him in boot camp, but it all dried up. In time, and he kind of got a little discouraged because nobody remembered him. My mom and dad was always writing him and so forth, but that that's a natural thing to happen. Kids go on, we go on, we get distracted, we go on, and we forget. Paul's saying, "You guys have it. You keep sending money, you keep writing, you're still involved." So there's something here. He's recognizing how faithful and how involved they are in their lives. And it's also telling you and I that you and I are not alone as Christians. One of the things I always like to see is our teenagers, because we come from a little country church or whatever, that they come to the big city and they go to, let's say, YEC or the youth camp or whatever, and there's thousands of teenagers. And they say, hey guys, see this? Y'all aren't alone. You're You're in something that's bigger than yourself, bigger than our little country church, this is fantastic. Wherever you go in the world, there's going to be other believers. There's going to be other Christians. And you can fellowship and you can find them. And it's encouraging. So we as Christians don't have to be lone rangers. We don't have to be Christian hermits. We don't have to be just solitary Christians out here. 
There are people to fellowship with. There are Christians to be part of and join up with. And notice how Paul is continually thankful for these believers. He needed them. Though they couldn't come visit him in prison, but they're in Rome. They're in Philippi. They're over in Greece. All right? They're hundreds of miles. I don't know exact distance, maybe a thousand miles away. But he needed them, and he, he's he recognizing them, and, and even those that might be irritating or problematic to him. And we'll read about that later on. Uh, but what's he thankful for? Well, first of all, he's recollecting, he's remembering. All right? He's glad they're in his life. But I think he remembers preaching and going to prayer meeting down on the river and meeting a lady named Lydia. Remember who Lydia was? She is a business lady. And, and so she was prominent in the church. Then he probably remembered a night he spent in jail in Philippi. Him and Silas got thrown in jail. But the Lord blessed and, let, and saved a man that was a jailer and his family. Lydia and, and this Philippian jailer and his family is like the charter members of this church. They started it. And, and I think Paul probably even laughed a little bit, you know, when thinking about how that the city leaders had to come down the next day and apologize and set him free for falsely arresting him in, when he was a Roman sin, uh, citizen. And so I think that was always a humorous thing in his mind that the people of Philippi had to do this and so forth. But more than that, he's thankful that these people are partners with him. That they are in, involved in ministry here. They sit t help time and time again when other churches weren't. When some were abandoning him, when, when some were cursing him, when some were saying all kinds of bad things about Paul, Philippi was always there supporting him, encouraging him, taking care of him. But see, that wasn't just in the past. Is also ongoing and, and more in the future. Look at verse 6. Being confident of the very things that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The goal for you and I as Christians, we don't get to set. Sometimes, that, boy, if, if I could be this as a Christian, and that's good that we think about and you have spiritual ambition. That's one of the things I've tried to encourage over you. Set some high spiritual ambitions or goals. But at the same time, remember, Jesus' goal for you is be like him. We're being conformed to be like him. Sometimes our goal is that what we think may be ambitious isn't quite as ambitious as what he's got for us. But we need to always be striving for more than ever be satisfied and say, think I've arrived. Because that's when we'll fall flat. That's when we'll fail. That's when we're going backwards here. But understand, is Christ working in us? This is what he's, he's saying here. Uh, who's begun a good work in you, he's going to do it. He's going to finish it out. Now, perhaps his, his joining these people, Philippi, is because he's looking at them through eyes of faith. All right? He, he's not looking at them as they were back there five, ten years before than when he first encountered them and, and won Lydia and won the Philippians yeller and so forth to Christ. But I think he's looking at them what they can become. What they should be. Sometimes it's difficult for us to get along with one another. We just rub each other wrong. We, we have this natural tendency to saying the wrong thing, putting our foot in our mouth, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time, whatever. We don't try to, but somehow it happens. But one of the ways that will be easier to get along is we see what God can do in each other's lives. See what God is working on. Not just see who they are or what they are right now. They're an irritant right now. They're a pain in the neck right now. But what is God going to do? When you see God's working in one another, when God and you see that God's going to do something in their life, you know what? I can put up with this person a little bit better, a little bit easier, knowing it. And I think Paul's even looking at that and saying, I know God's working in your life. I know what he's done. I know where he's brought you from. And I know where he's taking you, where he's raising you up. And I think this is key to getting along. So I think this is comforting verse. Verse 6 is one of those great verses, being confident of this very thing, that he who's begun a good work in you will complete it. He'll finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's something is ongoing. All right, now that tells you and I that the, nothing's perfect right now. What was that? I used to have a t-shirt back to when I was in service. Somebody gave me, 
says, don't judge me yet because God's not finished with me yet or something of that nature. You know, we're not there yet. All right? God's working on each and every one of us to grow us, mature us, and make us like Christ. Now, to, again, to have some spiritual ambition, to have some goals, those are adequate, those are good, and, and we have to do our part. But ultimately, he who has begun a good work in you, he, not you, not me, he will finish it. He will complete it. And therefore, it's his responsibility to get that done. Now, we know that we're all in the hands of the Lord. Sometimes, though, we're not willing to be willing to be what he wants us to be. Do you hear? We're not willing to be willing. We have our own goals, our own ambition. We have what we think is, is what we fit in. And say, God, here's what I want to be. And God said, no, I have something, but you got to be willing to be willing here. You have to yield. Now, God is this, this great way of changing circumstances on us to get us to the point where we're finally willing to be willing. Are you? He's going to do the work. What he starts, he's going to finish. Now, you may be resisting. You may be kicking all the way. But he's going to get his job done. He's going to start and finish his, his task. You know, you may think you're in control. Sooner or later, you're going to wake up one day and realize, he took me the rough route because I was so resistant, but he got his what he wanted done. And, and that's how it works. So, you either go the easy way or you go the hard way. Are you going to be willing to be willing or he's going to have to wake you up one day to make you willing to be willing? All right. Now, stop me if you've got questions or comments or other scriptures go along. Don't let me just go on and on and on tonight. Pardon? Sounds like Jonah. Sounds like Jonah. Jonah didn't want to go. He wasn't willing to be willing. All right. He had to learn the hard way multiple times. And... and we're that way. That's our tendency. You're right. Now, Paul recognized in his relationship with the, with the people of Philippi that their, their lives were blended. They were together. Look at verse 7 and 8. And notice, uh, I think there's four times in this whole passage where he says, you all. I think he's an okie. Alright? You know, I just say you all. But, you know, he says you all wrote it out properly. Just as it is right for me to think this of y'all, you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense of, and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I am for you all with the affections of Jesus Christ. Now, I think Paul is anticipating their reaction because Paul's been bragging on them. He's he said, guys, I love you. I'm joyful. I'm thankful for you guys. And I think, they're going, oh, shucks, Paul, we're not that good. You know, why would you say such a thing? And, and he says, no, this is how I feel. He says, I, I have affection for you. I love you. I have fond memories of you. And, and this isn't just, you know, human affection. It isn't just a friend, fond feeling. He said, God's my witness. He says, God has given me something. In fact, it goes on and, and, and tells us there with the affections of Jesus Christ. The reality is, we want to say, I love you and mean it. But sometimes the only way we can love one another is through the power and the person of Jesus Christ. Only by him can we love. Love, really to truly love, is impossible sometimes. And, and yet we are commanded to love. And folks, when you're in a church with all kinds of people brought together and you're all thrown together from all cultures and backgrounds and history, it is impossible to love everybody. But through Jesus you can. You find a way. He, he makes, you, makes it possible. He gives you what you need. And he says, I love you. This is through Christ. He's my witness. I love you. I, even those that irritate, there's those people that's got, causing problems in the church. Even the Philippi church, with, which is a good church and everything, there are still issues. 
The best of churches, what I've said in the past, when you find that perfect church, don't join because you'll ruin it. Alright? There's no such thing as a perfect church. We're all people. And so to love each other, it takes the grace and the power and the presence of Christ to truly love one another. And it, it, it is something that's important. Now, Paul has been praying, he's been praising, he's been com com commending these guys. But what's his desire for them? What is his will for them? What's his prayer request? Verse 9. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Now, if you and I were writing to some new Christians, what would we want to say to them? Well, if you've been a Christian for very long, one of the things that we all know as Christians we're supposed to do is share the gospel. All right? We're supposed to tell people about Jesus verbally, any way we can. Tell people about Jesus. Tell them. Walk. But Paul doesn't do that here. He talks about love here. He says, that your love may abound. I want you to have love more and more. I want it to abound here. He wants to stir up an act, the activity, if you will, of love. Now, think about this. To, to love may be the greatest witness. And if we have love, it's going to show itself. Go to 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. It's going to demonstrate itself. It's going to prove itself here. And, and so, uh, if we are truly a church of love, it will be seen. How will they know we're his disciples? By our love for one another. Love. It must demonstrate itself. It must show itself in activity. And, and so, for the church of Philippi, and probably for the church of Arcadia, and probably for any other church, the one thing that needs to be done is the demonstration of love. The activity of love. Love proving itself. It's kind of like what James did when he talked about faith without works is dead. Love without activity isn't real love. If it doesn't prove itself, if it doesn't demonstrate itself, if it doesn't have activity there, it's not real love. And so he's praying that your love may abound still more and more. But he goes on and says, and more in knowledge and discernment here so he adds those two things it's kind of like I equate it when Jesus said to worship in spirit and truth to worship without spirit is not real worship but to worship in spirit all spiritualism and motions without truth is idolatry and be foolish and so love without knowledge and discernment is an impure because have you not seen unchecked, unregulated bad love, you might say. It can be disastrous. What I'm saying is that, have you ever been around those who's, they're almost uh, what's the term? They're, they're Christians and everything, but they're almost consecrated blunderers. They're uh, they, they demonstrate sanctified stupidity. They have good hearts, their, their hearts in the, right, in the right place, but they don't love smartly, intelligently, wisely. They, they don't figure out, uh, how can I love and love the best? They just love in their own way, in, in emotional, and it doesn't, and sometimes it causes more harm than good. An illustration I've used over the years, kind of in this vein, you want to help a neighbor. A neighbor's house is, is needing a paint job. You say, I'm going to show them I love them. I'm going to paint their house. So you go to your, your shop, your garage, or wherever, and you get whatever paint you have. And you didn't ask what color that person likes. You didn't ask if they wanted their house painted. You just go about and get the painting. And what do you paint it with? What do you've got? Black, gray, pink, orange, whatever. And your demonstration of love was foolish. It wasn't not according to knowledge. You didn't see, you know, how many times a spouse's spouse bring home something. Is, Why'd you bring that home? Well, I was trying to show you I love you. 
I can't pick my wife, but I've done that with mine. I mean, back there early on, I did so, so for 41 years now, I haven't done it since. And she's even got, why don't you ever do Because that one time, you didn't like it. Love, if it's going to be a love, an activity of love, we need to do it with wisdom, with knowledge, with judgment. Uh, when I say judgment, or a discernment, there's a time, there are people that need help, there's a time to help. But there are people that don't need help, and there's time they don't need help. All right? One of the, the weaknesses of the church, and we could say the government, is we love to just throw money at it. We think, this will solve the problem. This is how we can love them. And it doesn't, it's not what they needed. We think it is, but it's not. The story of the prodigal son in Luke. The, the son went off to a far country, wasted his living, his inheritance. Do you think that the father knew where that son was all that time? That? No, don't go there because the picture of the father in the story of the prodigal son is a picture of our God. And he knows everything. Now, if he knew the, the son was over there in bars and dives and whatever, wasted his life and, and ends up in hog pen and so forth, why didn't he go do something about it? Why didn't he go rescue him? Why didn't he send some money? Why didn't he go help him out of it? Why didn't he go send somebody say, take him to AA, take him somewhere, get him out of there, get him a hotel room? Why didn't he? Because that's not what he needed. What did the son need? He needed to come to his senses. He needed to come to realize everything he needed in life was back home, was with the father. And when he was willing to come back, when he came to census, then the father was willing and give him what he needed. He was just as poor and just as hungry when he showed up at his father's house as he was there in the hog pen. Right? So sometimes just... Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Sometimes just because we think somebody has a need doesn't mean that's the real need. So it needs discernment. Needs time to look it over. Is that really the best thing we can do for them at this time? I've had to say no to many people who's asking for handouts at church. Uh, some of them I've helped. Some of them I've helped multiple times. Now, after a while, she says, no, this isn't what you need. I need to just say no. And, and it, it's hard. That's tough love. But it's love. Real love. And, and so, uh, love with discernment. Now, it goes on and gives us results. What, what would be the results of love, active love, of uh, knowledge, according to knowledge and discernment? Well, it tells us it will prove what is excellent. In other words, I think it puts things in proper priority, proper perspective, because one of the things is in life, we can get off, off base. We lose our focus. We uh, lose our priorities and so forth. And when we start loving according to knowledge and discernment, it proves what is excellent. You know, it gets things back in order. Look at verse 10 and 11. That you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So, when we, when we love, when in this love abounds, it starts to put things back in perspective. We realize what's really important for people is their heart, their mindset, their attitude, so forth, all right? Now, it says, further, uh, for sincere and without offense or without blameless. Now, that word sincere is a, a fun word when you think about its origin in the Latin and the Greek. In the Latin... It, it, it's a picture word, picture as meaning without wax. In Greek, it is mean sun-tested. In the ancient times down at the marketplace, they might would have, you know, art, artistic works, pottery, etc., whatever, and some of the time it would be frail or uh, faulty. It may have slight hairline cracks or whatever, and what they would do is take wax and pour in those cracks, smooth it over and paint it and cover it up and look perfect. But if you take that and set by heat, 
or out in the sun, the wax would melt away and reveal the truth. So it is without wax, without, or it's been sun tested. And that's why he's saying here, when we love according to knowledge and discernment, it removes all pretense, all the wax, all the falsehood. We are truly sincere with one another. If and he's saying we want love among the church, among each other, without all the pretense, without the the cover up, we want genuine, sincere love, and and and, and to be without offense, without blame, you know, be blameless here. And, and so this is what we need uh, as Christians. And what will the last result be? Fruits of righteousness. Now, what does that mean? Well, I think that that's kind of a summation of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So we're talking about the, the results of, of a holy character as focus on Christ, where he brings forth these fruits, and we just sum it all as of the fruits of righteousness. If you're going to be like Christ, you're going to have these fruit. You're going to be righteous. And, and so this is what Paul's praying for the church. Love. Abound in love, pure love, sincere, knowledgeable love, wise love, that's going to be sincere without offense, and it's going to be that of righteousness. And and so it's not going to come by positive thinking. It's not going to come by religious works. It's going to come by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ who dwells in us, who lives in us. That's Paul's prayer for the church. He is joyous. He's grateful for this church. He's filled with joy. But even with that said, the church has needs. We can brag on our church and love our church and be faithful to our church, but the church still has needs. And it's always going to be internal in our attitudes, in our heart, in our focus. It's always going to be about love. It's always going to be overlooking our own faults and our own shortcomings and failures and, and truly being genuine with one another. We are who we are and recognize that and live with, in that love, in that understanding. We all will have our faulty cracks. We all have that, don't cover them up, just be real. And love one another anyway. And sincere. Thoughts, questions, other scripture goes along. When you pray for the church, obviously we're going to be praying for people's health. And we're going to be praying for uh, people's financial needs or family uh, relationship needs and those type of things. Pray about people's hearts. That our church would be filled with love. Sincere, knowledgeable love. Discerning love. Wise love. Lo- love that will produce genuineness, sincerity, uh, righteousness. These are things that Paul prayed for. And I think those are good things for us to pray for. Thoughts, questions, comments? Pardon? Well, we'd like to see you back. Well, I I was missing. I missed last week. All right. And I appreciate Richard sp- uh, stepping in last week at the last moment and uh, uh, stepping up to the plate. All right. Let's pray. I am very thankful for Brother Richard, and and I can use Donald and and others, and and I appreciate that. And uh, watch out. I may ask you someday. <laughs> let's pray Father we are so grateful to be here tonight thank you for your word thank you for Paul and the church of Philippi we pray that you'll speak to us to help us to learn from it and Father how to be genuine sincere people of love uh, uh, have a love not just of words but love of action uh, that is active in our lives in our church in our community that proves itself each and every day thank you for your grace thank you for loving us thank you for being part of the we're making us part of the ministry of the gospel. We ask now that you give us each traveling mercy this night. And again, we lift up the many that are hurting, that's going through difficult times for the health issues. Uh, Father, for Robin, as she's traveling, she's away to be with her and her husband in their great time of need. Bless your church. Bless your people, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night. God bless. No, uh, 
No, John, no, John did not have, John the Baptist didn't have a book. That John, the Gospel John, and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John were all written by the Apostle John. Uh, the beloved that believed his head against Jesus is the Lord's Supper, a Last Supper. The one that was at the cross when Jesus died. He's the only one that was there. He's the one that wrote Revelation. Okay. All right. Paul wrote letters to the Church of Philippi, you see Ephesus, Galatians, Timothy, the Timothy letter, that's two Timothy from Paul. All right. No, 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 that was word of mouth. There is no, no letters by John the Baptist. No, no. No, Paul and, and John the Beloved wrote, and Peter wrote most of the New Testament. Luke, Luke wrote Acts and the uh, book of Acts and the Gospel of Luke. All right, so, and you'll, uh, don't worry. Look at the, most of, do you have it? I don't know if you yours have it. At the beginning of a lot of your, okay, you don't have a study Bible. Do you have a study Bible at home? All right, that may be something you want to, <coughs> that uh, study Bible may be something you want to get. So, so you can look at uh, the information about the book, each book, as you go along. And I'll have more verses. It'll explain words and so forth. And if you want uh, <coughs> recommendations of the study Bible, I can do that. Okay. You. You're welcome. Thank <laughs> you.